do. They tell you what you're doing. They tell you what you did. They do that because if communication is not clear, uh, people die. This slide contains the main reason for virtually all human conflict since the beginning of time. And you will, of course, get this slide. Even twins have different perceptions. People selectively collect evidence that supports their views. And so this is the main reason for virtually all human conflict since the beginning of time, which means that the next time you have a conflict with somebody, you need to be asking, what are you perceiving? What am I perceiving? Is there a difference? If so, why? What are you perceiving? What am I perceiving? Is there a difference? If so, why? That in and of itself will give you much better answers. I hope you've all seen this picture. There are two women in this picture. There's a young woman. At the bottom horizontally is her necklace. To the left is her chin. To the uh, right under her hair is her ear. And to the right left is her eyelash and nose. There's an old woman. At the bottom, uh, there is her chin. The horizontal line is her mouth. To the left up there is her nose. And then the ear of the young woman is the eye of the old woman. Missing, of course, the eyelash and nose of the young woman. So we've taken a group of people who knew there were two women in this picture, and we gave the young woman to half the class. We gave the old woman to the other half of the class. We took both pictures off the screen. We told people what they were looking at, and we had them look at their half for five minutes, and then we put the combined picture back on the screen. And when we did that, virtually no one could see the other one. So the question arises, if people have trouble seeing an image they know is there after seeing a contrary image for five minutes, how much trouble does one group have seeing another group's point of view that has seen the same picture for a thousand years? This is a much more serious problem than people think it is. They're not disagreeing with you because they're stubborn or stupid. They're disagreeing with you because what you see so clearly is not there for them at all. It's never been there. So in order to persuade them, you need to know exactly what they're perceiving and then paint them an entire alternative universe one brush stroke at a time. And if you don't do that, they will fight you for a thousand years. What happens in today's world? Instead, people say, our perceptions are different. You must be wrong. Doesn't work. Here are some uh, perceptions of problems of getting multiple parties to agree to a process. We do not all see the full picture, including myself. Um, that's fine. Let's get some more ideas from not having the full picture. Um, I often need to convince users something is their fault. That's not happening. People don't accept fault. Fix the problem instead. Get the decision maker to make my request a higher priority. Find out their perceptions of why it's not a higher priority. Otherwise, you don't even know where to start. Number four, my wife is afraid for me to get a gun. No, she's not. She's afraid of bullets. She's afraid of risk. If you had an old gun that wouldn't shoot, your wife's not afraid of that. If you had a no gun but a house full of swords, she's afraid of that. Gun is not the issue. What's her perceptions? It's risk and safety. Don't argue over guns. Maybe you want to put the gun in a safe. Maybe you want to put the bullets and the gun in separate places. <clears throat> my favorite is the last one, convincing my wife to ski again after having a bad fall on her first run on the last ski trip. The way to convince your wife to ski again is to say to your wife, 
If I were you, I'd never ski again. Unless you acknowledge their perceptions, that conversation is not happening. Dad, tell me why you hate smoking. For doctors, patients, I would hate this medicine if I were you. It's such a ridiculous thing to take all this medicine. What do you do when you do that? You get them to start listening, and then you get them to be persuadable. You say, what if they're crazy? I say, you don't get to fix that. Your only choice is you want crazy people who are persuadable or not persuadable. That's the choice you get. Next one. Differences are profitable. There's a lot of controversy over differences today. Almost all of it is, is misguided. The more different people are, the more profit they make as long as they value differences. Studies show that companies with work groups that have significant internal perceptual differences create three times as much value as consensus groups because differences create more creativity. Another study found that for each 10% of diversity added to a city, net income for the region increases by 15%, a vast amount of value. That's why Silicon Valley in the United States is uh, the most profitable region, region there is in the United States because San Francisco is the most diverse city in the United States. So if somebody says to you with some uh, frustration, we're different, you need to say, isn't that great? Just think of the money we're going to make. Can we disagree some more? You want to turn the paradigm on its head. And so some of the cities in southern China, like maybe Shenzhen, maybe Guangzhou, that have more diversity in them, that's why they're more profitable. So you want to find people who disagree with you. You want to find people who are different from you. More points of view, more creativity, more profit. Okay, so now I want to tell you how to put all this together. How do you actually add the value? And Sophie, would you like to take a break now or should I continue? Okay, so here is the second half of this, which is how do you add value? And negotiate. How do you put all these tools together? It is now just about 10.30. Let's take a 15-minute break, and then I'll show you how to take all these tools and add value. All right, everyone. Now let's put all this together and figure out how to add value with all these tools. And how we do that are trading items of unequal value. That is to say, everybody in the world values things a little differently than everyone else in the world. And you can fi if you can figure out what they value that's different from you, the easier to do the deal, the richer the deal, the longer term, and the better the relationship. And this isn't just like trading price for volume. It's any one of the billions of synapses that people have. The CEO of a major company in Philadelphia once told me the most important thing he ever did for his major client in a 20-year business relationship was to pick up the client CEO's mother-in-law at the Philadelphia airport one Saturday night. Has nothing to do with any deal, but it affects every deal. And so you need to find out more about the kind of intangibles that people value. Is it respect? Is it a football game? And those are the things you have to trade. And as I said, you can always uh, find them. Um, and this is different from win-win. 
I might want to lose today to get more tomorrow. Trading items is a lot more uh, specific. Someone I know from Google tried to get a multi-million dollar deal and the client wasn't interested. The person from Google found out in talking to the client that the client's teenage daughter was having computer problems. The guy from Google invested half a Saturday, went over to the guy's house, tutored the daughter, fixed the computer, and got the deal. For the guy from Google, what's half a day for a multi-million dollar deal? For the client, I can give this deal to any technology company. My daughter's learning are very important. Put another way, intangibles fill the gap between hard and fast legal, economic, and technical positions. And the reason that most deals fail is that the parties don't know enough about each other. Even if you've got government regulation or constraints, you can always make the guy on the other side a recommendation for a good vacation spot for his family. You can always trade them uh, information. You'd like to get a client and the client isn't so interested. You find out the client has a couple of kids. You offer the client, the client's kids, a tour of your place of business or factory, talk to some of the people, to write a paper for their school. If you're good at it, the, this kid will get a lot of information, the paper will get a high mark, the, the child will get a high mark on the paper. That parent is now a hero to their child. What's that worth to that potential client? And so those are the kind of things you have to think about. Put another way, as long as you personally and they personally are in the deal, all of who you are, you can never sell a commodity product because the deal is always unique since each of you are in it as individuals. Another person from Google that I know went to buy an apartment overlooking the water in San Francisco. Very nice apartment. When he got there, the open house was filled with potential buyers. And it was clear pretty quickly that the going rate was 15% higher than this person from Google could afford to pay. So he went and saw the owner in the room, started talking to the owner. How come you're leaving? What is it to do around here? I see you did a renovation. It's very nice. How did you do the renovation? And after a few minutes, the owner kicked everyone else out and sold this apartment to this guy from Google for a price 15% below what the owner could have gotten from somebody in the room. And you say, how is that possible? It's because life is about more than money. Money was invented because it got too hard to carry cows around. But it's still only a proxy for human needs. You find the need, it's a much better deal. Here are some uh, intangibles from various courses that I taught. My favorite is on the bottom right, stuck in an elevator with country music for some reason. But each of these things is either something to build on or something to trade. I got these from U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan of things that they traded with tribal leaders in return for intelligence. And I put this up in front of an academic week in Florida with a thousand U.S. special ops soldiers. And when I did that, a two-star general stood up and said to the group, this tells me that if I don't tell my soldiers to trade laundry detergent and Gatorade to tribal leaders in return for intelligence, my soldiers die. 
So this is pretty important stuff and it, what, what makes the best deals. So what intangibles do President Trump and President Xi both want? They want respect. They want an apology. They want people to, to, to say each can help the other. They want to stop being blamed for things. And the person that mentions these intangibles first owns that negotiation because they will get the other party to comply. These tools are not rocket science, but until you see them for the first time, uh, they're invisible. What if they won't tell you their needs? Another one of the most important slides in the course that you will each get. Well, you ask. They might tell you. You set an agenda. What are we talking about today? Each time you write down an idea, you've got more to talk about, more to trade. You talk about any subject. Doesn't matter what it is. Take notes, physical or mental. I was once at a party in Philadelphia with a bunch of people that had much more money than we did. And, uh, you know, we were sort of outsiders a little bit, but our son went to the same school. And I saw some guy who seemed very unapproachable. And I went over to him and I said, you know, uh, I really like your shoes. Your shoes are better than mine, but they're very stylish. Well, I couldn't shut the guy up for the rest of the night. He took me up to his bedroom. He saw me all his shoes. You know, you can make the connection through intangibles. And then he called me up a week later and 